I'm Dr. David Nathanson. I'm a breast surgeon. A hundred years ago, the only way to treat breast cancer was with what's called a modified radical mastectomy, which means removing the whole breast and all the lymph nodes under the armpit. And in those days, that was appropriate. But over the last hundred years, things have changed, evolved. Uh, we've, we've gotten to understand breast cancer a lot better. We can diagnose it at a much earlier stage, and so now it's not appropriate to use the same kind of treatment that was used a hundred years ago. But in order to change from that standard of practice, we have to do studies which, because they require a number of years and a large number of people, are usually done with large organizations over a number of years, and we do what we call recruit patients. Recruiting patients to clinical trials means that there is a standard way that this patient can be treated. We can just follow what the textbooks say. We can follow what Dr. Google says. We can just do exactly what's been done for the last 15 years or 10 years, but if we say, gee, we just think there's a better way to do this, but we've got to prove it first, the only way we can do that is if we can have patients understand that if we do that, we have an idea with a, an aim, and if we want to get to that aim, we have, to, we have to be able to recruit enough patients. This costs a lot of money, and it's usually funded by large organizations like the federal government, but it's also funded by pharmaceutical industries and state governments and so on, private individuals, donations. And, and we all do this, even though it takes a lot of extra work for all of us who do this. We all do this, uh, and, and we want to do it so that we can make it better for the next generation. So anybody who agrees to be in a clinical trial uh, needs to understand that this is being done with unknowns. That's the biggest issue that we have. So most people will say, and I would probably be the same, if, if I was, had a disease and the doctor said, well, we can treat you with a standard way, but, and we will, which is what clinical trials are, we still treat you the same way, but in addition, we want to add something. And it's that little addition, which is the question about how to change it and make it better for the future. So that's what clinical trials do. And at the end of the trial, we have to keep information. That information is kept very, very secret. We can't connect names to numbers. We can't have people pick up these names and trace them back to you, so you will not be known. The doctors who are doing this will not know your name. Uh, they will keep, keep the information very tight, secure. And this is very important because we don't want to be biased in our observations. We want to make sure that, that we do this with a, an honest intent so that at the end of all of this, we can get, gather all of the information together, have statisticians analyze this, and without bias, we can come to a conclusion about whether adding this extra piece of maybe a drug or a, or a technique that is going to really make, uh, make the next generation of patients better off. So the patient like you today, uh, you have a, a procedure done and you get drugs that are given because we know from previous clinical trials that this is safe and effective. We want to increase the effectiveness. If we hadn't had that opportunity, if, if doctors around the world had not done those studies, then this, in this day and age, you would still be treated like it was 100 years ago. In order to advance, let's say we want to test a new drug. We know what drugs already work. And it would be 
um, non, not ethical to now say, well, we're going to give you nothing compared to the new drug we want to try in order to see whether that new drug works or not. What we have to do is we have to take what's already standard practice. There are, let's say, three drugs that are already useful and work well. We would not deny you, the patient, uh, from getting those three drugs. That would be an essential part of the treatment because that's standard. The only thing is now we're adding a new substance, drug, which we think will work because it's been tried in, in lots of experiments in the labs around the world. And we know that, that it works in a certain way and we think that by adding it, we're going to actually improve your outlook, your outcome. So no, you're not going to be getting a sugar pill except if there's no drug available and now for the first time there is a drug available. So previously that would have meant that you might have gotten surgery and maybe radiation and no medication to take by mouth or by intravenous injection. But now somebody's found a drug that they think works with this disease and in that case because we want to make it blinded, meaning that I don't know when I give you a pill, whether it's sugar or whether it's got the drug in it, I shouldn't know because it might bias my opinion. Uh, I want to make sure that, that that happens appropriately, scientifically, prospectively. That's the only time that that would be done. The, the important thing about any clinical study is that this will not cost you anything more than your actual treatment would have cost you in the first place without being on a clinical trial. So, no, you don't have to pay. In any clinical trial, there is no reason to believe that the drug that you're going to be getting that's being experimented upon or a technique is going to be any better for you personally. So that's the important thing. We don't expect that you're going to think that this is really good for you personally. It, if it works out, then the next generation of patients will benefit. You may benefit, uh, but that's not the objective. The objective is to test it and to see whether it's safe and whether it's effective. So when we go through the process of getting approval, because this is a lengthy process, it, in, it requires approval by a group of experts, and this has to be done with lay people on a committee. It's called an IRB, Institutional Review Board. And we cannot do any studies without having those studies approved by the IRB. And this is carefully monitored by the federal government, by state governments, uh, all the time. We have auditing of that to make sure that, that this, is, this is accomplished in, a, in an upfront, open way with no biases at all. At the beginning of a trial, before you are actually recruited and on the trial, you will have an opportunity to sign a consent form. Uh, and the consent form is often quite lengthy. It has a paragraph on that particular topic. And it will tell you directly, and the person who gives you the form in the beginning of the study needs to go through every single paragraph and word on that form to make sure you understand exactly what you're letting yourself in for. That means that the, the paragraph says that if you're in the middle of this study and you think something is bad about it because of something that you feel, you may feel a side effect that you weren't imagining that you could get, nobody knew about the side effect and all of a sudden you get it and you say, I've had enough of this, I don't want to do this anymore. That's perfectly fine. Nobody's going to tie you down and hold you down and make you go through the next. You can just quit. Having a cancer center 
is a very important component of a, a large institution like Henry Ford. Uh, it's something that we've wanted for years. And the advantages are for both patients and for the staff who take care of patients. Uh, from the point of view of the staff, we're talking about doctors, nurses, researchers, ancillary people. We all learn. We learn from each other. We learn from patients. And it's very uh, cumbersome if we aren't in close proximity to each other. We can call on the telephone. We can use the internet to connect with each other, emails, Twitter, whatever, modern media. But it's not the same as having a three-dimensional person in front of you who you can talk to on a friendly basis because they're colleagues. And so that's how we communicate and communication is key. So that's as far as the, as the, as the staff is concerned. Having a cancer center brings everybody together. We all go to the same place. We're not in different buildings or in different parts of the city. And we can actually, real time, talk to each other. I can walk across from my office to my colleague's office just down the corridor. And I can knock on the door and say, I've got this patient and I'd like to talk about this. And that's a real, real plus. So that immediately translates and is easily understandable as how it can be great for the patient. Because there is no doubt that that kind of communication between professionals makes the management of the patient that much better. And so we all are all the time over looking over each other's shoulders, making sure that everything is done properly. We're not cutting corners. We're doing all the right things because we are learning and we are learning more and more and extra stuff. We are able to communicate this with patients and patients can be sure that nothing is going to be missed because if you are a single uh, practitioner in a small town and you have to do everything on your own, having to keep up with all of the, the changes that happen in medicine is extremely difficult. We all read, we all go to medical meetings, we learn that way, we listen to um, pods and stuff, radio programs, CDs, discs, etc. So we learn all the time. And that's important. And keeping up with our own education so that we can translate that to the patients is extraordinarily important. But if we're all in one place and the patient comes to us, then that patient knows that that's going to be translated into their care, which is going to be higher efficiency, higher quality.